The year of our Lord, 2194, the first battle to reclaim Earth is fought. General A.W. Spears had trained an army of the same alien creature that had overtaken the planet. His soldiers would exemplify the potential of the Xenomorph. That's what they wanted in the first place, wasn't it? To study the alien, to control it, to weaponize the perfect organism. Spears' first battle would prove his methods were the righteous and glorious path to victory, that more funding, more specimens, and more perfect soldiers would be at his disposal after his demonstration. Earth would not be forgotten. Earth would be won back. So, how did we get here? It was 2192 when the Coast Guard vessel Dutton discovered the abandoned cargo ship, the Junket. They still called it the Coast Guard, even though the coast they were guarding is three or four hundred miles out in space. It was a lot cheaper to abandon a ship than retrofit and refuel, especially the old-style nuclear jobs. A lot of the industrials just dumped them in decaying orbit, waiting for gravity and atmospheric burn-up to solve their problems. The Coast Guard was tasked to tag these floaters and blast them before they could decay into the atmosphere. The Dutton was on a routine mission to clear floaters from entering into Earth's atmosphere, and that is when they encountered the abandoned cargo vessel. Their probe ship observed the aftermath of some horrific encounter. Dead bodies floated in the ghost ship, bloodstains all over the floor and walls, the words, kill us all, do it now, and please it hurts, written in blood. Acid and bullet holes surrounded the interior of the vessel, the pilot pod ejected. Data from the ship's history was copied and sent to command before the Dutton itself was destroyed by a stray xenomorph pulled in by the vacuum of the blast. With this data, Dr. Arona and the Earth government had the coordinates to the xenomorph homeworld. Bionational Corporation, however, had the missing pilot of the junket, James Lukowski. Lukowski had a facehugger parasite attached to him. He was carrying the embryo of an alien queen under observation in Bionational's labs on Earth. That's when the dreams began. Some of the dreamers had such an intense affinity with the alien they believed the end of days to be upon them, and the only salvation was to become host to an alien parasite. An obsessed cult led by televangelist Salvahe raided Bionational's labs and set the queen free. That was the beginning of the end for Earth. A few short years and the Earth had been completely overtaken by them. The cultists are still out there, searching for other survivors and bringing them to the hives for harvesting. The Earth government's failure when it comes to the Xenomorph has further origin than the grave mistakes of a competitor. The 2179 Acheron mission was seen as a disaster. All of the colonists of Hadley's Hope, almost an entire platoon of marines, an atmospheric processor, and any chance of attaining a specimen was lost. And the dreams came home to Earth with a few survivors. Hicks spent the next 13 years drunk, isolated, and trying to forget his own failures. Newt was institutionalized, drugged daily, half in a dream world where her memories could not be trusted. It was not until she was actually face to face with Hicks all these years later that she realized he was not just some man from her dreams, he was real. She dreamed of her parents dying, she dreamed of the aliens, she dreamed of Hicks saving her. She never dreamed of Ripley. And Ripley, her dreams were... powerful. Ripley, and the rest of the crew of the Nostromo, they responded to the beacon. They made first contact. We should have never found that ship. In his cabin, Spears laid out his uniform for the initial upcoming battle on Earth. He'd saved one dress uniform, the build cap with the gold braid and his star, the regulation black silks with his ribbons and medals, the Evershine orthoplast over the calf boots. He'd wear a belt with his two antique revolvers and the uniform's dress sword. Strictly speaking, of course, it wasn't SOP to wear dress blacks and ceremonial weaponry into a combat sit, but while he was going to be on scene, he wasn't going to lead the troops into battle. No, he would command from the rear this first time. He was too valuable to risk himself in this foray. He would be the most valuable man on the field, not simply because he was the only man on the field, but because if something happened to him, the war was over. Only he and the Queen could command these soldiers, and he could hardly trust her to continue the fight if he were gone. No, he would stand back this once, until he had more troops, more humans to help him. He was, after all, the commanding general of the Colonial Marines now, indeed, commander-in-chief of all military forces. And why not? Once he brought back records of his success, once he showed whoever was left how the job had to be done, who would dare deny him the rank? And if anybody could be that stupid, a wave of his hand could remove that obstacle. Sick em, boys. Spears smiled. It was all going so well. Aside from a couple of minor glitches back at third base, nothing the historians would linger over unduly. 
and everything had run as smoothly as lube on glass. It was only a matter of days now. All the years of preparation were about to pay off. He rehung the uniform, put the sword and boots away. He had decided to land in South Africa, a northeastern section of which was once called the Natal Province. In the late 1800s, the area had been ruled by a native named Kichawo, who had commanded a large army of warriors known as the Zulu. They were fierce fighters, the Zulu, and there had been a lot of them, but even so, they'd been no match for the technologically advanced British when it came to war. In one famous battle, a small unit of British soldiers withstood an assault against a vastly superior number of Zulu for some days due to their better weapons, tactics, and training. Spears related to that. A tiny force, well-directed and focused, stopped an entire army. All things being equal, it was the commanders who decided the battles. The aliens were fierce, savage, hard as iron, but they fought like ants. They had not learned the arts of war as had men, and few if any men knew those arts as well as Spears did. Give me a lever and a place to stand and I will move the galaxy, Spears thought. He had his place. His lever flew with the ship with him. He was so full of anticipation he could hardly breathe. Only a week away now, Earth loomed large ahead of Spears. He tried to settle down with a history of gladiatorial war, but the text did not hold his interest. Over the years he'd forced himself to learn patience, to wait, but it was hard now that he saw the goal was so tantalizingly close. Here was the light at the end of the tunnel, the finish line for a race run long and hard. He found himself staring at the image on the viewer and when that wasn't enough, lifting the outer armor and looking directly at the distant planet through the thick, hardened glass. Don't worry, I'm coming to save you. I'll be there soon. A few more days and your liberation will begin. Hicks and Newt stowed away on the MacArthur had no way to stop the general on his warpath. He had full control of the ship and the pair of survivors were just there along for the ride. This left much time for Newt to reflect. Time passed slowly in the darkness. I felt so lost, so alone. Hicks spent the first day searching for a way to seize control of the ship, but his knowledge of computer technology didn't extend to countermanding a navigational mainframe. For a time we were worried that Spears would find a way to bypass the ship's environmental control, but sequestered in his alloy cocoon, Spears ignored us, lost in his visions of war and glory and the stimulants he relied on fed his paranoia. Finally, logic exhausted, Hicks reverted to raw, frustrated instinct. That the cockpit was designed to withstand explosive decompression meant nothing to him. Hicks's fury no longer had anything to do with mutiny. It was about hatred, vengeance. The ship's controls were locked, but the comm was operational. Hicks wasn't going to be making any outgoing calls. He didn't want to take the chance somebody might overhear them. So far, he didn't think anybody knew they were here and not that he had anybody left to call anyhow. But somebody knew they were here. The board cheeped with an incoming, complete with visual. Bueller. I stared at his face, his eyes so carefully designed to create the illusion of humanity, and then I realized the scientists had failed. Bueller was no more human than those alien things. He was better. He didn't look any worse for wear on the screen. Newt couldn't tell where he was. There was some bland, office-like background behind where he sat, behind a desk. Hello, Newt. I've got this channel in a security pipe, computer guided. Nobody can overhear us. If you want to talk. If you don't, I understand. Mitch, I'm here, Newt said. I'm so glad to see you're okay, he said. There was a muted explosion in the background. What was that? Grenade, probably. The alien drones left here are running amok. Spears took the Queen. I think they can sense that, somehow. Oh, God. There's nothing to be done about it, Newt. I'm here and you're there. If there is a god, he or she or it has a warped sense of humor, from what I've seen. I... I've been trying to understand what happened between us, trying to make sense of our passion. But there is no sense to it. It just happened. Random. Unpredictable. Like life. There is only one perfect truth, Newt. I love you. I will always love you. I hope you will one day forgive me. The picture vanished before she could reply. Mitch! Carrier's down, Hicks said. He stared at the blank spot where the feet had been. He wouldn't look at her. If she'd been him, she wouldn't have looked at her either. She felt like shit. She cried for what seemed like a long time. She thought about Mitch's final words. Forgive you. He protected me, held me, loved me, and I left him to the alien. He would be alone forever. That was my perfect truth.
Maybe when we get wherever we're going, we can make Spears pay for this, Hicks tried. She looked at him. Whatever it cost him won't be enough, she said. Her voice was dead, calm, flat, unemotional. Maybe not, Hicks said, but it'll make me feel better. After that, neither of them had anything to say for a long time. Their silence turned to further desperate planning. They knew they had to get off this ship. Hicks, what are we going to do? Right now, nothing. We don't have any armament, nothing to shoot with except the hand weapons, which won't do us any good. Oh yeah, we could go EVA. We got a few suits, but we're accelerating. And there's no way we can make up the relative speed. The squirt guns in the suits won't push us hard enough. That's not to mention what would happen if Spears decided it was time to make the leap into Einstein while we're outside dicking around. Newt blinked. He couldn't tell if she was really interested in this or not, but he pretended she was. See, the drive fields pretty much follow the contours of the ship generating them. If we were hugging the hull, maybe we'd go along for the ride, but anything that stuck out, an arm or a leg, maybe, would be left behind. Newt blinked again, didn't speak. The field is better than any armor we've ever devised, you know. Nothing gets through it, so we couldn't get back inside. So even if we didn't get razored in half, there would be, outside of the ship, for however long we were in the warp, months, a year, maybe longer. Maybe that wouldn't be so bad, Newt said. Maybe, if you don't mind running out of oxy and choking to death on your own CO2. And when the ship did drop back into end space and eventually started to decelerate, our bodies would zip on ahead and probably spend eternity tumbling through space. There are better ways to shuffle off. And worse, Newt said. Yeah, there are worse. So where does that leave us? Waiting. We can wreck this ship. Spears doesn't want that, not with his little army of monsters on board. Maybe we can threaten him. Tear out the computers, get control somehow. Ram the son of a bitch. Or maybe once we come out of the warp and start to slow down, we can get a chance at something. Such as? Hell, I don't know, Newt. I don't have all the answers. You got here at the same time I did. Maybe if you weren't feeling so fucking sorry for yourself, you might come up with something. She stared at him. You knew Mitch was an android. Before I ever met him, you knew. You didn't tell me. Hicks glared back at her. Yeah, and I tried to tell you to stay away from him, didn't I? You weren't having any of it. You can't blame this on me, kid. I did everything but lock you in your quarters to keep you away from Bueller. It never occurred to you I might know what the hell I was talking about, didn't it? Old chemhead, 20-year-old grunt, what the fuck could I know about anything, right? Newt looked down and said, You're right. It wasn't your fault. I'm sorry. He felt his anger evaporate. Jesus. Big tough marine beating up on the little girl. It's okay. I'm sorry too. That was all either of them had to say for the moment. Before they could pick up the thread of the conversation again, the ship's warning buzzer sounded. Shit. That's the ten minute signal. We're going into warp. Warp space does ugly things to your mind if you stay awake. I did half an hour once, part of a test group. It makes your worst nightmares seem tame. Newt shuddered, and you knew how she felt. They had both dreamed about the aliens too many times, and those visions were horrible enough. Hicks, are we screwed? Yeah. He's dropped the pressure door down the hall. Fucked the controls up. Must have known we were coming all along. Can't we get outside the ship? Maybe. I could probably manage to unseal the hatch we came in if I tried hard enough, but the minute we step outside, he'll shake us off like fleas from a steel dog. We'd never find another way in in time. Can we blow the ship up? He looked at her. He understood the thought. If they're gonna die anyhow, might as well take the bastard with them. I don't think so. This is a military-grade vessel. I could set off what grenades we have, but it wouldn't do much more than ruin the aft section, if that. These ships are built in segments, airtight compartments. We could take out some inner walls, but segments are armored like the hull. The drives are amidships and out of reach. Even if we did cripple it, we'd die as a result. So that's it. Well, we might get to the oxy stores buried in the walls here and bypass his control. Might get air enough to last a couple more days. But not to get to Earth. That would be my guess. Sorry, kid. We tried. We lost. That's the way it goes sometimes. Nothing we can do. Not unless we can convince Spears to turn over the keys to the escape pod. Maybe if we said please. Hicks thought about that for a second. I've got a better idea. Maybe if we said, or else. Hello, General Spears, said the voice from the comm. 
It was on the suit radio op-chan, right where he thought it would be. Spears leaned back in his forum chair and nodded at the comm. I was expecting you to call, son. Nice try, but you lose. Maybe, maybe not. Newt and I, we were hoping you could see your way through to cutting us loose. What would be the point, Marine? It's a long walk home. You'd never make it. We could if we had one of the two escape pods. Spears grinned. That you might, but I'd have to give you one, and I don't really see that as a possibility. Nothing for me to gain. We'll trade you for it. Son, you don't have anything to trade. How about nine linked M40 grenades, all set to go off at once? So you blow out the ass of the vessel and kill yourselves. It won't even dent the armor amidships. Nice try, but you ought to know better. Oh, I didn't mean the grenades we had here, General. Spears leaned forward. What are you talking about? Well, Newt and I, we figured you were pretty good when we flew up here, given our experiences so far. We had to bet there was a good chance you'd take us out. Good bet. Yeah, well, you're a general, but we figured what the hell, if we died, we could have the last laugh. Keep talking. He had a feeling he knew where this was going, and it sent a chill through him. So before we left, I rigged a little explosive in the MacArthur. Kind of a going-away gift, you know? With a timer. We gave ourselves plenty of time to get here and beat you. Plenty of time. Got an hour or so left. You're bluffing. I can see how you might think so, but we aren't. And can you take the chance? If we did wire the ship, your tame monsters get an e-ticket ride to nowhere in about 58 minutes. Your command general. Adios forever. Spears stared at the comm. Hicks was bluffing. He was pretty sure. But if he wasn't... Damn. Could he take the chance? Now if you want to trade, here's the deal. You cut one of those pods loose within the next two minutes. That way you don't have time to go and play with it. Newt and I, we leave the ship, rendezvous with the pod, and radio you the location of the bombs. You can get to the ship and deactivate them in the other pod easy enough, with 20 minutes to spare. Assuming I believe you and do this, Spears said, what's to stop me from blasting you in the pod into atomic dust with my ship's guns the second you radio me the location? Your word that you won't. Spears grinned wider. My word. You're a man of honor, aren't you, General? Of course, son. Spears chewed at his thumbnail. He couldn't take the chance that Hicks was telling the truth. Not with his army at risk. All right, Marine. You have a deal. Newt grinned at Hicks. He bought it. We ain't home free yet, he said, but he grinned back at her. He'll probably plan on taking us out with the ship's guns as soon as we're in the pod. What about his honor? Are you kidding? He's a sociopath. He's got as much honor as a spider. So how do we stop him from shooting us? I have an idea. If we're fast and lucky, it'll work. If not, we're no worse off than when we were before. I'm with you all the way, she said. It's not like I've got another engagement or anything. Once they're in the escape pod, a small ship capable of weeks of cramped flight, it wasn't 20 seconds until the comm lit with the incoming call. All right, where are the bombs? Hicks was busy putting the drive system online. He powered up the small engines, activated life support. Strap in, he ordered Newt. She obeyed. Where are we going? There's nowhere to hide out here. Yes, there is. Watch. He tapped a control and the little ship moved forward. Hicks, I want the location of the bombs now or I will cancel our agreement and blast you. Too late, Hicks said as the pod moved almost back to where it had been launched from the ship. What good does this... His field of fire covers a full sphere, but there aren't any guns directly under the pod launch bay, and he can't elevate it or press any of them enough, so he can't accidentally shoot himself. Or us, in this case. The tiny ship rode a few meters away from the larger vessel. Can we stay here? Not for long. He'll start playing with the drives and we'll lose contact, but he can't wait. The clock is running. Hold on. Hicks touched the comm. General, you want to go to the power control box for the alien's tanks. The main cable from the generator to the control cabin, where it leaves the forward circuit breaker and the G-drive housing, next to the gyro switch complex. Damn, I thought you were bluffing. No, but I lied. You've got about ten minutes to pull the charges, not twenty. If you dick around trying to shake us so you can chew us up with the ship's guns, you might not have time to save the MacArthur. There was a moment of silence. Then... You would have made a good line, officer, son. You got more guts than a slaughterhouse. Thank you, General. All right, you can tell your grandchildren you went up against me and survived. That'll mean something someday. Tanute, Hicks said, hang on. 
With that, he turned the pod so it faced a ship and two clicks behind them and hit the thrusters full power. The little ship shot out like a minnow darting from under a shark. The G-force was strong enough to press them back into their seats. I don't think you'll shoot in this direction, Hicks managed to say through stretched lips. You won't want to hit the MacArthur. I hope. I hope you're right, Newt said. This time, Hicks was. The escape pod shot past the following ship so fast it was only a blur on their scopes. Spears shook his head as he raised from his squat next to the drive housing. There weren't any bombs connected to the gyro switch complex. Nor had there been any in the other locations. The son of a bitch had bluffed him. He felt a moment of irritation and urged to wrap his hands around the marine's throat and throttle him. But it passed. It didn't matter. So one marine and one civilian had saved their skins by lying to him. So what? After he demonstrated how he would liberate Earth, who would believe such a story, assuming the tricky bastard Marine and his woman were foolish enough to even try to spread it around? Of course, there might be bombs, hidden somewhere, on the MacArthur, but Spears didn't believe it for a second. No, he'd been foxed. Once more, he offered a two-fingered salute to Hicks. Good Marine, that one. In the tiny cabin of the pod, Hicks blew out a big breath. Did we make it? Newt asked. Yeah, we did. He's outside our radar range, but he must have gone back to the cargo to check it out. I'd love to see his face when he realizes there weren't any explosives rigged. I'll pass on seeing his face again, thank you. Hicks laughed, then frowned. He got away though. He beat us, and got away. I wanted to get him in my sights. You ought to be glad he didn't get us in his sights. Where are we, by the way, and where are we going? We'll be inside Luna's orbit in another couple of days, if the guidance computer on this piece of junk can be trusted. I'm getting some signals from the region, too faint to hear much. Could be automatic from Earth, or something from the colony on the moon, if it's still there. Gateway station in L5 orbit, maybe. I've got the scanner set to pick up the strongest input and home in on it. You did real good back there, Hicks. You're a lot smarter than you let on. You think so? Yeah, and a whole lot smarter than you look. She smiled and he returned it. He fucking hated losing to Spears, but she was right. It was better to be alive to fight another day, and at least they had that much. And they found themselves a little bit of luck in the L5 orbit in the days to come. Approaching vessel, identify yourself. The call came. This is Gateway Station calling. Hicks smiled at Newt. This is the escape pod from the Colonial Marine vessel MacArthur, he said. Two passengers aboard, uncontaminated, repeat. No alien contamination of the ship. Pod MacArthur, you are in the grid. We'll fly you in Lazy 8s until the decontamination team can rendezvous with your vessel. Estimate arrival time in nine hours. Copy, Gateway. We'll be there. Newt lifted an eyebrow. They have to check us out to make sure we aren't carrying any toothy little surprises, he said. That means the station is clean. Gateway is pretty big, half the size of the old Luna 1 colony. 12, 15,000 people before the trouble on Earth. Probably built a few more modules since then to make room for escapees. We'll be quarantined until they are damn sure we aren't infected. That'd be my guess. Run us through a CAT scanner or some Fluoroprog and we'll get home free. I can't believe it, she said. We're finally going to get somewhere safe. Maybe, he thought, but looking at her face he didn't say it. He only nodded. Spears, back on the MacArthur, remained focused on his mission. His affinity with the Xenomorph only growing. I watched them disappear into darkness. I let them go. I wanted them to go. The alien is the only one I can trust. Their loyalty transcends human treachery. Together we will form a new world. I will lead man and alien alike toward a new glory. A new beginning. A better tomorrow. Spears brought the queen out of deep sleep first, still securely in her cage of course. She could see him through the clear walls, and he flicked the cigar lighter over and over, watching the little flame reflect off the heavy clear steel plastic. Oh yes, I know you remember me. The time has come for your children to go forth and do battle. You can lay a million eggs if you do as you're told. If my soldiers obey me as they should, do you understand? He put his hand on the plastic. The queen turned her head slightly, but did not move. She understood. He was sure of it. Not the words, maybe, but she was smart enough, he knew that. The drones weren't too swift, their wattage was real dim, but the queen wasn't stupid. She knew him, and she remembered him, and he was certain he'd put the fear of God, in the form of spears, into her. It would go all the way it was supposed to go, and soon the moment would be upon them. 
Some, of course, will perish in the terrible struggle ahead. I know that. I respect it. But in the end, we will prevail. I can hear the adulation of the masses as I rescue them from their misery. I can hear their cries of joy as I inspire them to rebuild our world. I can feel their love, their admiration, their fear. We were on the cusp of a truly historic moment when the tide would turn against the human disorganization of the past. My boys would make us proud again. It would take most of Spears' remaining fuel to land the carrier, but he had the APC for his own return to orbit. The reason he had brought the MacArthur was that it could stand a dunking in atmosphere and normal gravity. He expected to take heavy casualties despite the training and arms his men had, but that was to be expected, and the ship would have to stay behind. It was unimportant. The cameras were on, the automatic director picking the most dramatic shots according to the program Spears had installed. Low angles on him mostly, with plenty of background stuff he could cut together later. Fully dressed, Spears moved to the staging area where the troops, numbers glowing dimly on their heads, stood quietly, awaiting their orders. Slime dripped from their mouths, and there was a slight clatter of hard chitin when they moved or touched each other. Stand by, men, Spears said. He went to strap in for the final approach. Weather radar said there was a storm front moving across the landing area. Damn. He had hoped for a sunny afternoon. Well, the cameras could adjust for the lighting. He could clean it up when he edited it. Besides, a little lightning and rain would only add to the drama. This was all background stuff anyway. Once they were down, he would have his computers send out a live broadcast of the battle. The fortunate watchers could say they had seen it as it actually happened. The ramp lowered and Spears walked out into the rain. In the rainy distance, Spears saw shadowy forms approaching. He drew his sword and pointed at them. First squad front and center, second squad fan out and cover the flanks. The time has come to prove yourselves, to show your commanding officer all you have learned. We must give no quarter. The others are your enemies. They must be destroyed. Attack. He had decided to hold off on giving his men weapons until he saw how his close combat tactics worked. Number 15 moved close to Spears, turned its head, and looked at him. Go get them, trooper, Spears said. He waved the shining stainless steel blade. Number 15 stood motionless, then its mouth gaped and jelly-like drool dripped from its open jaws. I gave you a direct order, Spears said. Number 15's inner jaw oozed past the outer teeth. I'll not have disobedience. Spears swung the sword. It was heavy, made of good surgical stainless, with an edge sharp enough to shave with. The blade caught the alien's thin neck. The strike was perfect, slicing between the vertebrae into the thinner and more flexible material over the spine. Number 15's head toppled off and fell. Enough acid clung to Spears' sword blade so that it immediately began to smoke. The metal dissolved and ran under the pattering of the rain. Spears stared at the ruined blade and the smoking of his hand. God damn it. He dropped the sword and pulled out his flame units. He fired at the corpse of number 15. The old guard must be overthrown. They must be defeated. Half a dozen of the troops came out of the ship behind Spears, the queen along with them. She paused in front of Spears, looking down from her four meter height. He made her aware of the power of fire held in his grasp. That's right, bitch. I'm the man with the fire. I cook the babies. Fuck with me and we'll scramble some eggs, you bet. Like dogs, the aliens could not really smile, but the queen seemed to, the way her jaws moved. She loomed closer to Spears. Hand still on the trigger, the realization of the queen's will dawned upon the general. My god, you used me. You wanted your precious children back and I... I brought them to you. And then she grabbed Spears and lifted him, using her larger arms. With a quick move, the queen's inner jaw pierced into Spears' skull, nearly taking his head off. They tracked Spears' ship back to Earth, and there was nothing. His revolution ended before it had a chance to begin. The alien wouldn't allow it. Gateway Station was all humanity had left. Civilian technicians monitored the last sporadic signals from Earth in a terrible death watch. The platform had become an oasis for the few survivors capable of finding transport. The alien had reduced us to voyeurs, cataloging Earth's final hours from the safety of space. And then I saw her. She was still alive. On Gateway Station, Newt and Hicks cleaned up and went to make their report to the powers that were. A lot had happened since they'd left Earth, nearly all of it bad. So the medic leading them to the debriefing station had said. After the debriefing, Newt met Hicks in a conference room nobody seemed to be using. There were view screens on the wall. There she saw the little girl on Earth. 
she was with her uncle. Still somehow, they survived on the overtaken planet. The man spoke, hoping his transmission would reach someone. The city's gone. Most of those left alive have been subjugated to the alien's will. You can feel it, some sort of subliminal impulse that draws you to them. A feel of warmth. Belonging. The creatures are building some kind of a nest, spreading it across the city, into the streets and underground. A repository for their young, or something more? It reminds me of another time, years ago, somebody said from the doorway. Somebody Newt recognized. Another little girl lost on a world swarming with the alien bastards. Ripley, Newt said. You're Ripley. The woman gave them a brief, small smile. That's right. You're supposed to be dead, Newt said. From what I hear, so are you two. The universe is just full of surprises, isn't it? I'm tired of watching. It's time to finish it. In this series, I'm recounting the Earth War as depicted in the Aliens comic series. The accounts are explored as originally published despite certain names, locations, and other events having been altered over time. For more on the Earth War, you can check out the accounts of the Earth War playlist on the end screen and stay tuned for the latest videos. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it, and if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like, and you can also subscribe for all the latest videos from the channel. A very, very, very special thanks goes out to Wayland yutani executives Emiric and Lady Anne, part of the Patreon Hive. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.